Hello and welcome to DungeonCast, news and discussion from across the tabletop. So, this is the second of our DMing special episodes, and I've got Ben and Rich in the dungeon again. Hello. Um, suspiciously wearing the same clothes. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's like Daniel Radcliffe. We're doing it because of the paparazzi. So. Um, and last time on this series, we were talking about uh, campaign building and talking through issues about your setting, whether you approach it from a bottom-up or top-down view, uh, theme and mood, and uh, the experience of your players and how to leverage that in your building your campaign. Um, yeah. If you haven't caught that one, uh, there's a link below in the video uh, description. Uh, so go and check that one out as well. Uh, click like if you want to. Um, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on these uh, episodes as they come out because we'll be doing some more of these. Yeah. Um, on today's episode, we're going to be talking through uh, adventure hooks, um, flexibility in your plot events, and the perils of the sandbox, which I think Rich coined that one. Oh, I really like that one. <laughs> so that's cool. Um, so um, we'll get started. Hopefully there'll be some interesting tips and hints for you on how to start to flesh out your adventures. Um, and yeah, click like if you like what you see. If you have any questions, put it in the comments below and hopefully we'll get back to it on the next one. Okay? Excellent. Cool. Okay, so adventure hooks. Right, I, I have a beautiful anecdote that I feel <laughs> I must share. Okay. For adventure hooks, and it comes from a friend of mine who'd gone to a live action Conan weekend. <laughs> okay. And they were all sat in the bar drinking heavily because it was a Conan event. They, in were, character. they, they were in character. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Um, and That's just what happens at LARPs anyway. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and an orc burst in with an arrow through his head, and he went, Arg, arg, the orb of Xantos, and died in the doorway. And the players stopped, looked at him, booted him out the door, and then got back to their drinking. <laughs> so half an hour later, the same orc... <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Comes in again and goes, Arg, Arg, the orb of Xantos. And the same thing happens again. Third time he walked in, <laughs> he had, still had this arrow stuck through his head. And he just opened the door and went, Oi, you lot, the orb of bloody Xantos. And walked off. Yeah. Okay. And that, as adventure yeah. hooks go, you can see what they were trying to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've got to make sure that you do get your players interested early. Yes. Because if you don't, you got the same orc walking in three times, three times, <laughs> yeah. banging his head against the door, yeah, demanding that the plot be followed. And you can't. Take your orc. <laughs> you can't yeah. always railroad your players. You there are times when they don't want to do that. Yes, yes. So what's a good way of building, picking hooks and using them in a way that will get people interested in the game? Well, I think in that context, burning the tavern down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Then definitely be annoyed then, wouldn't they? Yeah. And if you said, oh, the guy who owns the Orb of Xantos burnt the, burnt the tavern <laughs> down, they'd all go find him straight away. Yeah. <laughs> I think this kind of touches on what we were talking in the last episode, when we are talking about the experience of your players and the mood of your setting. And if you've had that kind of conversation, yeah. you're going to start to have a bit of an idea of yeah. what kind of things they're going to be interested in. What characters exactly. have you got? If you started building your characters... Uh, do you have a bunch of paladins who are going to go off, or staff fleet officers, yeah. who if there's a bad thing going on, they're duty bound to go yeah. and check it out? Or do you have some sort of miscreants, it's a slightly grimmer, darker thing, yeah. and you have to personally challenge them yeah. to bring them in? Or offer them a big pot of cash. Yes. And again, paladins, not going to go off and pick up the big pot of cash, unless there's a direct need for it to be donated to yeah. a charitable cause some needy children yeah save yeah. the orphanages and, and they can't do it with just a dancer like you're saying, <laughs> you can solve everything with a dancer that's true <laughs> it ties back to what we were saying last time as well about the setting as well mm. if no one knows what the orb of xantos is all about yeah yes then it has no relevance yeah They're like Someone's left, lost their ball. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> oh hum. Yeah. If you explain that the Orb of Zentos has some relevance to the setting, wait, wait, we don't even when like you're orcs anyway. Campaign, yeah, yeah. Then. Yeah. And why is that guy that killing orcs? Yeah. He's exactly. a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. If all the orcs are bad guys. Good on you, mate. That's yeah. It. It's all about you crack tying that in to your setting and making sure that yeah people understand what the relevance of your plot hook is as well. Yeah. I think it's a really. It can be a tricky thing to get people, yeah. especially if you've got a large group of players and they've got yeah. quite different characters. 
yeah, there can be yeah, a challenge around different hooks that get certain players in. Yeah. Um, it, it can be useful if you've got new players, a mixture of new and experienced players, in your first few sessions to maybe get the experienced players kind of they they will have done yeah. this before they'll know oh, okay yeah i'm yeah. i'm part of the guard i need to go and figure out what's going on and then yeah. they can kind yeah. of bring the other people with them um but adventure hooks and using them in the in the in the right way are very interesting that you can just sort of throw in small comments that mean nothing but players think yeah that's a hook and they go after it and they run off down a rabbit hole and they're nowhere near the story yeah. that you originally and that that happens all the time yeah if you're new that happens all the time and even when you're not it still happens yes on occasion when you yeah. throw in something for purely entertainment value for no you. plan um, ever survives its first encounter yeah. with the players yes in my current uh, my D, &D yeah. campaign that's just started to check out the link below um <laughs> i mentioned to the guys that there's a pirate island somewhere uh, and <laughs> some of them were instantly oh let's go and fight the pirates and then someone said no let's go and be a pirate it's like, <laughs> like the pirate thing's not part of this i was just giving you wider context of the world <laughs> but yeah that kind of thing it's yeah you almost need that computer game type element if you can't right click this item <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> this is not something you can interact with. Please move on with the story. Mm. Um, and it, it's hard to take that away around a tabletop, whereas computer game context is it's built in. Yeah. The computer says no. But yeah. you, you have to sort of say, no, we need to. We do need to steer away from the thing that you're obsessing over that isn't relevant. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and often that often can... Times. The, the initial hook can be built into your kind of yeah. initial setup for the game. Yeah. So, you know, you're all gathered around... Uh, it, unless you're starting them all in a tavern and you're waiting for someone to wander in with an arrow through their head, um, you can have them all uh, pulled together to be doing a particular mission. Yeah. They're Starfleet officers on a particular yeah. mission, so they're going in that direction when it begins. Or they're, um, as you talked about in the last episode, they're all in prison together, yeah. and the first thing is let's get them out yeah. And, yeah. and all that kind of thing. I think it's something that our club model that we're using really lends itself to you because you mm -hmm. can, you actually instead of having to wait for the players to discover the hook yeah um you tell them what the hook is in the trailer yes and if you look at the yeah. way a lot of modern trailers are going they will throw in hooks for yeah. the story yeah, and absolutely. things that are coming up in anticipation of you going to go looking for them yeah so rather than having to have people wonder yeah. what the point is you tell them up front this is an adventure in which you will be doing x mm -hmm then they know that yes. that's where they're starting yeah, yeah and so the hook is something that you can deliver out of character and then the MacGuffin is more of an in character <laughs> yeah, yeah. tool yeah yes so you've got that sort of in out of character duality going on mm -hmm. yeah you're interested you've got... both your players and your characters as well yeah yes yeah and that's that's a really good point actually because yeah. you want the characters to be interested but you've got to have a reason or you want the players to be interested in the game and the but you've got to have a reason for the characters to get to into engage, the story yeah, yeah. Yeah, now that's really interesting. That's Hooks are, you know, one of the key tools to to getting people moving along, and you can kind of throw them in as the game yeah. continues to kind of take things yeah, in a certain they, direction without necessarily forcing people down. They do route. have varying degrees of subtlety, like you're saying. You can force people down a certain route by, you know, non-player characters march into the scenario and mm -hmm. herd yeah. them off where you need them to go. Yep. And sometimes you do need to take that approach. <laughs> yeah. Occasionally. Yeah. Well, I think and there that, is the world continues. Yeah. The world exactly. is carrying on, whether yep. the players or the characters, sorry, are interacting with it or not. Yes. The world is still happening around them. You need to let that world continue to happen. You can't let everything wait on the characters to do whatever it is yeah. they're and going this... to or meant to do. Mm. So if yeah. there is an invasion coming and the players show absolutely no interest in finding out or stopping it, then the invasion happens. Yep. And then they deal with the consequences. And they deal with the consequences uh, exactly instead of the invasion. In, ties in with our next point, doesn't it? The flexibility in your, your plot events. Yes. When you're coming up with your overall plot, you're going to have core things that you want to happen in your story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And regardless of quite how far your players have deviated from the route you're expecting them to take, those core events are still going to happen. Mm -hmm. They're still going to happen for the yep. story to develop in, in the way that lets you tell the overall story. Yep. They're filling in the details, the, the actual script as it were is coming from them yeah but the overall view of the story is all yeah you know, absolutely by yourself yeah what general. i find quite helpful in that context is to have um, almost a nemesis group so 
anti-players, if you like. So you've got your player group and you know what, yeah. you can't control entirely what they're doing. Sure. But you've got a nemesis group that run counter to them that have their own goals, which are in direct opposition to the players. Mm. So your nemesis group is going to do their thing. Yeah. And yeah, they're going to get derailed occasionally as well. Yeah. But now either they could come into contact with one another, in which case you've got a perfectly balanced conflict. Yeah. Or they don't ever come into contact with each other and your nemesis group reaps their goal before or after your players yeah, reach yeah. theirs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now that's a useful tool to kind of have yes. things moving along. Your recurring characters that keep coming back and keep influencing events mm. and therefore the, those recurring characters are positioning themselves in the, in that context as well. Yeah. They're coming back, they keep influencing events that are relevant to the characters. And by doing that they make themselves relevant and help to pull the plot forward as well. Rather than rely entirely on your players to do it. Yeah, yeah. I think there's key. Yeah, it's it ties back into that setting element and whether yeah. it's a grand heroic thing or slightly less sort of grim dark. That kind. If yeah. you had Star Wars, for example, if uh, Obi Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker didn't leave Tatooine, yeah. you know, the the Empire was still rolling along and still building the Death Star and still going to destroy. But yeah. Obi Wan Kenobi in that context is the recurring character. Yeah, Gandalf. Yeah. Yeah, in yeah. Lord of the Rings, they're not player characters. You've got to make sure they're, they're not. They're NPCs. Yeah, yeah. So they're there to direct the yep. players. Mm -hmm. uh, if you yeah. look at the, the events of The Hobbit, mm -hmm. 12 fighters and a zero level thief. Yeah. So you've got Gandalf come and along and say, <laughs> go and do that. Yeah, it, yeah. he doesn't fit in as, no, as a no, part no. of the adventuring group. And he does repeat that again yeah. through Lord of the Rings as well, in that Gandalf's there for a proportion of the early part of the plot and then he goes away and then he yeah. gets taken away from the story the, the characters then get to explore the environment on their own devices but if they've gone off with him later on yeah, yeah, yeah. to to bring things back together and to re-coordinate yeah everything, but if they'd gone off with much, him yeah. at that point they'd have been desperately out of their depth exactly. and yes. dealing with something yeah, yeah. that they couldn't possibly yeah, hope yeah. to manage exactly yeah. and it's a good example of those those plot hooks and like you said with obi-wan as well obi-wan is there for the duration of time he's needed for the story yep and yeah. then gets taken away, so he's no longer there as a crutch for the who are actually the core characters of yes, the story. The people you want to tell the story about. Yeah. But they then leverage a way for him to come back in and drop yeah. yes, plot exactly. hook points yeah. at future yeah. intervals as needed. Yeah. But yeah. so that he's not going to be there permanently. Mm. Core things. And because I mean, as we've just mentioned, they crop up time and again through science fiction and fantasy stuff, these types of characters. And the reason they're uh, there is because they are a great way of developing a story and mm -hmm. you know they're a good way of imparting world information to characters yep. characters who are meant to be quite young and naive about the world mm -hmm. you can get that important information without just having to give your players a book of text sure to read through. yeah yeah they are passing on their wisdom it's a classic part of the, yeah. the hero's journey yeah, yeah. there the is yeah. the old wise mentor yep. who yeah. bestows wisdom on the character mm -hmm. and then goes away Exactly. Or yeah. gives them a magic sword and then goes away. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Generally a magic sword. Magic swords yeah. are optional. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. No. Magic or laser. Yeah. One of the two. It's it's kind of core to the <laughs> heroic journey. It's it's a tool of some kind. Yes. Yeah. 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 Again. But this is interesting, you're yeah. talking about delivering of information. Yeah. So you've got hooks, but also your characters will need to gather information yeah, as they go along true. about the plot. Yeah. And and this is kind of where we're talking about the flexibility. You know, you don't have to prescribe that every piece of information comes from a particular person. Yes. No. You don't want to say the barman will tell them this because yeah. what if they don't go to that tavern? Yeah. Yeah. So what you need to be able to do. A tradesman will have this information. Yes. So either yeah. they go yeah. to the market or yeah. wherever they, they go. A beggar yeah. or they talk yeah. to the barman yeah. or the city guard happens to be a bit chatty one yeah, night. So. Yeah. So the information can be delivered. It doesn't have to come from a specific person. If you've got specific people, they don't have to be in specific places. It's yep. um, it's like electrons. You either know where they are or where they're going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, interesting. So the the plot point can be delivered by whoever mm. is relevant yeah. to deliver it. Sure. And the NPC that they need to interact with can appear wherever yeah. they choose to go yes and um, everything about that npc can remain largely the same their mm -hmm. character their personality yep. how they interact with the player characters and what information they have to impart all stays the same mm. it's just where they fit in is it the captain of the guard in the capital city 
or is it the barkeep at a small town, ta- small yeah. village, yeah. who runs a tavern, who's mm-hmm. actually a retired adventurer and who has this inter- information? Sure. The core of what information he's got and how he delivers it stays the same. It's just where you drop that character into the story. Yeah, so as you're and starting to yeah. build your adventures, you should have your hooks clearly in mind, yeah. but then the information that the characters need to then get onto the next stage, you should think about being yeah. flexible about flexible about how yeah. you deliver that information. Yeah. So don't tie specific um, events to specific places or people. So you can, you, as your yeah. players sort of wander off in different directions, you can still service up the same information. Yeah, and then they precisely. can still move on with the story, yeah. even if they're pursuing what they want to pursue. Well, this yeah. is where we were talking about flowcharts. Yes. Wasn't yes. it as a useful tool? Because yeah. I, I know a lot of gaming manuals and books that are out there don't flowchart. No. They Instead, they, they provide you with these walls of text mm. that yeah. says the players will do this. Well, you know, it's not unheard of for the players to not do what you're expecting them to do. It's almost unheard of for them to do. <laughs> yeah. In most yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you are new to DMing, yeah. then that's a, a very good and piece of advice. That's the <laughs> preparation. I mean, that's where you go into too much detail yep. early on, and you find that instead of leading your campaign, you've tethered yourself to something that actually isn't entirely important. Mm. It doesn't really matter to the story who that NPC is, who, yep. where they crop up. Yeah. What matters is that they do crop up. Mm-hmm. If their personality is important, then that's a core part of it. Yep. And the information they pass on, they're the important things, yeah. not Definitely. who they are within the setting. No, no. So, so, so if you're doing a Thieves Guild yeah. type game and you're running a heist and you know what the heist is going to be for yeah. and you know who's important, you don't need to go through and work out the entire backstory no. of every single member of the Thieves Guild. No. You don't need to care about every single guard. Yep. Um, you need to know the details of the, the big movers and shakers in the guild. You need mm-hmm. to know how they interact with the players already, because the odds are good that the player characters are going to be fairly high up in yeah, the guild yeah. anyway. There may be one or two lower ranking people that look up to them. Mm-hmm. There may be a couple of guards that they're familiar with that they need to yeah. interact with, but they don't need every single guardsman no. in the city to be named, identified, right. backstory. But again, at the by same not time. defining those things, you actually free yourself up as well. If you need a particular character to appear to drive the plot, yes. by not having already defined who the member of the guard at the gate of yeah, the city yeah, is, yeah. you can make that guardsman suddenly become someone important. Yes. If you've already written down for yourself and defined that that person's A, not important, does this, married, two kids, you know, will only ever go to his job at the guard post at the gate, then you've railroaded yourself and yeah. you've led yourself very down true. a very rigid, rigid yeah. path, which is difficult to deviate from. Yeah. Give yourself no, flexibility true. to adapt to what your players do. That is, and you're f- a lot of DMs are worried about trying to uh, make it up on the fly, yeah. you know, do it off the cuff, it, and it's not a case of that. It's having prepared enough information so you know what you're going to provide to steer the yeah. story, but you're not nailing yourself down to the way you're delivering it. Yeah. So yeah, flexibility is really important. I mean, yeah. a lot of my games, I I have, I know what information I want them to find out, rumours that they're going to hear, yeah. but it doesn't matter who delivers it to them. They're going to go to a tavern at some point or to a, yeah. a shop and they'll hear that information. The key thing is you're not writing a novel. Yeah. No, exactly. You're not writing yes. a novel. If you're writing a novel, you are writing that <clears throat> story entirely by yourself. Yes, you don't need players. You just collaborative effort. Exactly. You're trying to engage your players to help you create a story. And then you've got the arc defined, but you're help getting them to give you all the detail and all the interaction. Yeah, it'll help them to feel rewarded for what they're doing as well. So if their their adventures are growing and they're still moving along with the story, then that will give them a sense of confidence, especially if they're new players. Yeah. That what they're doing is the right thing and they're getting into the game and you can kind of move things along. Yeah. So, yeah, you've got a set sequence of events that have to happen to yep. move the game forward, yep. but they don't necessarily have to happen in any set sequence. I think uh, mm. Neverwinter Nights, yeah. the computer game, yeah. actually did a very good example of that. There was one. There's one stage of the game where there are three side quests that have to be completed before the game can continue. Mm. 
but it doesn't matter what order you do them in. They're yeah, not yeah, specifically yeah. leveled. Sure. They're leveled depending on when you do them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you go off and do one adventure first, it's the easiest of the three. But if sure. you do that same adventure last, it's the it's hardest tougher. of the three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they've got three things set out that you need to do, but mm. it's up to you, the player, which order you choose to do them in. And if you go off and do part of one and then you come back and do part of another one, then you can actually run all three of them simultaneously running backwards and forwards to the central point. Yeah. But at the same time, it's still appropriate to what you're doing yeah. at the level yeah. that you're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, that's good. Okay, um, I think we talked about flexibility in plot events. That's covered it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Much, yeah. Um, so try and stay flexible, but have some detail that you can you can share. Yeah. Um, our last topic of conversation for this episode was the perils of the sandbox, yeah. which dun, dun, dun. yeah, perils of the sandbox. <laughs> it's, it's that thing. If any of you have played Fallout Four, there's always a settlement that needs your help. Yeah. That's the problem with the sandbox. What will happen is your characters will just roam around largely aimlessly and you'll keep throwing random events at them to try and draw them back to the main story. Mm. And what you need is you need to have enough. Again, it comes back to the plot hurt. Yep. And you've got to have enough things to draw them back to the main plot yeah. without being rigid about it, mm. enough to draw their attention back to the story you're trying to focus on. Yeah, so I think, the, the, I mean, I've played in... I've run a few sandbox games and played yeah. in a few sandbox games and often it can be kind of like you're in the town what do you want to do and then you're like uh, can I go to the shop yeah you can go to the shop let's go to the shop and you're never quite sure yeah. where it's going as a player and you want and you do want some sense of where the story is going the sandbox yeah. where you've kind of got you're kind of almost hook free kind of thing or they're kind of buried out there and they've got to go and find them before you've got one served up yeah. can be quite um, challenging for some players. Yeah, give people options. Yeah. Say, do you want to do A, B, C, and have as long a list as you like? Yeah. But when you throw things completely open, especially early on with characters, they find it very difficult to yeah. know what they should be doing. Well, if you don't know the and character yet, you don't know what the character would do. Looking for, sure. Yeah. They're looking for those plot hooks. They're roaming around, waiting for you to drop that hint. Yeah. That's essentially what your players will be doing. Yeah. I personally. When I start a new game, I like to have the first couple of sessions fairly railroady. Not yeah. completely, but with a very strong sense of where the players are going for them, you know, yeah. where their characters are going, what they're doing, what they've got to achieve. And then hopefully by the time those couple two or three sessions have finished, yeah. they've got a wider sense of the world, what their character is doing, what they want them to do. They've seen some things, yeah. you know, they're like, oh, that was quite interesting. Can we go and have a look at that? And then you can start yeah. to open the world up. If you start with the sandbox, it's kind of, it, it can be it can be tricky. Especially if you have a story that you do want to tell. Because mm, yeah. if you've got a story that you do want to tell, but you've sandboxed it and you want the players to go out and find it, you have to let them find it. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where they go, they still need to find it. Sure. In which case you're de-sandboxing yeah. your story. A sandbox <laughs> game really yeah. shouldn't have a story to tell. Yes. It should be something that just grows. So with a sandbox campaign, you have to have a yeah. top-down campaign going on. Yes. Because yeah. there has to be things going on in the world for them to then interact with or not. Mm. You can't do a bottom-up sandbox game. Yeah. Because... You'd be there forever as well. Yeah. Drawing everything out. <laughs> there's, there, there's literally nothing for them to do. Yeah. yeah. For a sandbox game, there has to be a world plot. Yeah. A purely sandbox game requires a lot of confidence on part of the players and the GM because everything is going to be completely ad lib and off the cuff. And I think mm. you've got to make it a long term thing. It can't yeah. you can't do a short running sandbox game. A sandbox game has got to be completely open ended, something that yes. could potentially run for years. Yeah. Just so that all of your players do get to have their poke in the sandbox. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean I ran it I played in a short one at the club which was a Western uh, yeah. themed game a bunch of very disparate characters with very different um, reasons for being there there was nothing that tied us all together we had a lot of fun in the game uh, but it eventually turned out that basically I just tried to take over the town yeah. uh, and kind of roped a lot of the other characters into trying to help me out and that's exactly what you'll end up with with the sandbox you'll have one or two of the players or characters with the stronger personalities yep. will tend to be defining what happens yeah. for the entire party mm, yeah. and then it becomes the X and Y show not, sure. yeah, not and, the team the and that becomes certainly <clears throat> over the course of 
multiple sessions mm. less fun for other people typically yeah. some people might be happy with it but most people aren't happy with consistently just being a supporting character no. in what is essentially someone playing around with yeah that i mean that comes back to the experience of your players yeah, which does. we talked about in the last episode you know if you have some people who prefer yeah. to be passive and they when they join in they really enjoy it but they prefer to be passive and let other people do a yeah. lot of the initial talking yeah. then yeah. that's fine if you've but if you've got new players who don't know a lot about role playing yeah. or your setting or the system they can get kind of lost yeah. they don't know what the potential is and then you've got you've got trouble yeah and those players are your prize time for the very linear bits of your plot mm. that you want mm. make those newer players the focus of those linear bits of plot because yeah. then you're leading them a bit you're guiding them you're helping them to get into that character the rest of your group and the rest of the party should be happy to support that in that they know it's a newer player yeah, so yeah, they appreciate sure. why yeah. and use that as a tool for developing the plot as well mm. use that as the bits that you need to be relatively linear on well that's your entry level and that's yeah. Yeah. isn't it that's yeah. your starting point yeah. exactly. your starting point needs to be something that is almost a meta event yeah an event that everybody knows is a training thing yeah. uh, a warm up exercise yeah, yeah yeah but in the same way that you would warm up before doing exercise of any kind you need a bit of a warm-up for your characters and your players to get yeah. into exactly what it is you're trying to do so your first encounter really needs to be like a training exercise and yeah. it needs to be something that is connected to your plot hooks yeah. yep. but doesn't have to be the arch yeah. wizard of thorg is going to yeah. rain holy fire down exactly. on the town because he's got his orb back yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, <Santa. laughs> yeah. it's about making it clear that, that those early couple of sessions and those early couple of encounters and quests, whatever mm -hmm. they are, are really, they're, they're your prologue to your story. They're your opening scenes. Yep. They are letting everyone know what the characters are. Yeah, the players yeah. can get used to what the characters can where do. Where the characters get introduced and defined are. Yeah. What, rather than where the story gets developed. Sure, sure. Yeah. You have, a, you you have some link to it. Series, sort of... You find out very much most of the detail about the characters, the core important details, all gets covered in the first couple of episodes of a TV yep. series, yep. or within the first 20 minutes, half hour of a film. Yep. Yeah. And that's what those first couple of encounters should really all be about. They're about sure. defining the character as an individual. Mm -hmm. And then and, we go and get on into the meat of the story. you get the into the meat of the story. Yeah. Well, because that's what makes there it There has relatable. to be a vampire in the first episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, because otherwise it's Buffy the girl who might be a vampire slayer <laughs> yeah, in the yeah, exactly. episodes. Yeah, but it's just a vampire, they all team up together, and then you've got yeah. your, we're, we're a unit, and we can kind of work together. Yeah. That's it. So even your, what you said earlier, go yeah. into the basement and kill the rats. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah, still be, but... well, not if your innkeeper is the guy who's got potentially a bit of useful information for them exactly. that yep. lead them somewhere. Yep. If there's something going on with the rats, are they an indication of a plague? Is mm -hmm. that plague? So you know, you can turn a, a mission that everybody knows exactly. is a training mission. Yes. Fight some skeletons, kill the rats in the basement. Bandits on a road. Yeah, bandits on the road. That yeah. I did yesterday. <laughs> it's always bandits. It's always road. I did yeah. a, a rats in the basement. Yeah. training mission once only they were undead rats in the basement of a mausoleum because the kid who lived in the family estate was practicing necromancy <laughs> on the choir so oh, the nice. players went in to kill yeah. what they thought were regular rats, rats and yeah. they were like skeletal rats and zombie rats yeah. so no more challenging yeah especially but it had a hammer yeah. but it then linked yeah. in directly to that's the overall that's a really good example that's a really good example again you're setting that tone you're you're carrying on what we've been saying about you're, you're setting the tone, you're giving the theme, you're giving the mood of yep. the campaign yep. through those first couple of encounters. Yeah, they're, they're, you're establishing scenes. You're establishing scenes, your yep. expectations of them and their expectations of the campaign. You're setting all those things up and tearing them up for later on where the encounters and what you're asking of your players gets a bit more challenging. Mm. You know, it actually worked out really well as well because what we ended up with in that situation was two of the players barricading themselves in a room with yeah. one of the last surviving maids in the house yeah. while uh, an undead dog tried to batter the door down to get to them. Yeah. So all of a sudden they've got a vested interest in keeping this character who was completely irrelevant yeah. mm. up until that point yeah. Yeah, yeah. alive. But at that point, that character suddenly became useful for delivering plot points mm. and history and that's, and that's where your story. flexibility that's comes touching in. back on our flexibility yeah. of yeah. plot and dropping in those core events and the core information mm. 
Yeah. Through she might tell them that yeah. the bar the barman has been talking with certain yeah. traders recently and then yeah. you've got a hook to go and talk to the barman, find out that information yeah. and go on. Cool. Exactly. I think that's Okay. Okay. Really cool points there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Necromantic so, nine year olds. Dear trouble. To be avoided. Trouble. Cool. Okay. Right. Well I think that sums up that for this episode. Um, hopefully that gave you some good information about hooks, plot events, uh, perils of the sandbox and our establishing scenes. I yeah. think now we can kind of yeah. call it. Um, so please, uh, any comments that you have, questions, yeah. put them in the uh, boxes below. Uh, please like the video uh, and subscribe so you can stay tuned and keep up with the rest of our episodes about DMing, creating campaigns. Um, I think, what, what was the topic we're going to cover next week? That's systems, I think. And yeah, we'll talk about systems, and if you're building you a game system, yeah, and what impact what you that keep has, and what you what you throw away as well. Yeah. Okay. So next time we'll be talking about that. Um, so, uh, I mean, thanks for watching, um, and yeah. hopefully we'll see you again in the dungeon.